Welcome to Cremention in the Cellar, number 111. And gaming parlance, that'd be three aces, which will very often make you some money. Uh, while I'm making this, it's a dark day in American history. Okay, we'll uh, stay out of politics because I don't go there. There's in there here. Okay, before skills and non-weapons proficiency came out, if someone wanted to do something complex, we just had to make an ability check on a D20 or 3D6. I agree. And here's the second one. I agree about skill-based systems. In the 70s, we didn't have those extra rules. We didn't have a problem. And I agree. Um, I still do the same thing. I've always done it. Try something new, roll a 20. Not against any number, necessarily. Just see how well, see if it's going to work. we got so much fantasy going on. We really don't know. So why not? Now, sometimes I'd say, okay, roll uh, higher than a nine. Because maybe they had a big high agility or something. And so gave them a better than half chance to, to do the thing. Um, and then once they showed themselves adept at something, well, they noted that on their character sheet. And, um, they're like, hey, I did it last time. I'll do it again. And so each time they had a better chance of doing it. Good adaptive play. Um, okay, now this is a legitimate statement, but unnecessary, I think. I prefer using gnome instead of dwarf to do the other meaning of dwarf, referring to something or something, something, someone or something that is short. I understand your sensibilities here. However, dwarfism is a recognized medical condition. Now, the word midget is the one that will get you in trouble because of its insensibility and um, other connotations. Dwarfism is a recognized medical condition in our world. A dwarf is a recognized creature, race, whatever, in our fantasy world. But hey, if that's fine. Of course, gnomes and dwarves aren't the same. They aren't the same thing. But that's okay. I mean, it's your game. You, do, you play the way you want to be comfortable. Because that should always be the case. All right, this guy, he's, he's, a, he's a peach. Uh, what I always loved about fantasy and sci-fi RPG stories is sometimes not even playing the game, but studying goofy or silly stories, discovering how ridiculously absorbed I find myself and my fellow intellectual and <laughs> monkeys disagreeing, dramatizing those petty disputes and technical technicalities of fictional bullshit, and then laughing ourselves apart. Mm, that's a word I didn't know, uh, or an abbreviation, I'm not sure. Laughing ourselves, U-P-P-B-N, reminding ourselves it's all fun and game, and in the process, being eternally grateful. We got our asses distracted from fear, porn, propaganda, and slippery slope politics and real-life issues. Okay, yeah. Um, whatever part of it, um, I would sometimes um, be writing an adventure, um, well, some of the ones I've written, and go off for a week or 10 days doing research and not using probably 6% 6 of what I researched, but I just got lost down that rabbit hole of researching um, and found it quite enjoyable. And, yeah, we do that. And, yeah, it's escapism. No, no one's ever argued that fact. It is escapism. Uh, we do this, you know, my buddies and I get together every Wednesday night to get together, have some laughs, uh, commiserate about how rotten everything is, and then get on with playing for the rest of the night. Um, it's, a, it's a great release. Now, here's a really interesting question that I don't necessarily have 
uh, a hard and fast answer for. However, why are swords favored over axes? Game systems, art, and so on. Battle axes look more intimidating. Yes, they do. You're right. Um, let's look at some historical axes. Now, the Danish fighting axe, while it's not big and bulky, is probably one of the more fearsome weapons you're ever likely to encounter uh, on a battlefield in that era of fighting. If you don't believe me, watch a couple episodes of the fir- out of the first couple, three seasons of uh, Vikings on History Channel and see how wicked they are in the, in the hands of a skilled user. Floki, for instance, when he's doing battle, my God, he's a terror. Um, and it, again, uh, they could fight with two of them, so they didn't need the shield and can kill you with either hand. Um, battle axes. Um, the um, English Huscarls that fought William at St. Michael. Hastings, as you know it, um, were known for their proficiency with a big, wicked axe. Their shield wall was to be feared, and when they uh, formed the the pig or you know whatever Saxon uh, formation they used, it was terrible to behold. However. The axe is described, and the samples that we have require a great deal of strength. Both arms, both shoulders, the back, and strong legs to plant yourself firmly because you're swinging when you figure out, and I'm not a math guy, the velocity of that big axe head, full tilt, the force it hits with, etc., it's going to jar you too. Swords are considerably easy, easier to use. Now, I'm not saying use well, because axes you got to have some kind of skill to be able to use them half faster or or better. Swords, depending upon the sword. Now, a great big two-handed claymore obviously takes some sort of knowledge to be able to not hurt yourself or your friends with it. Um, If you want to go to the unrealistic um, sword fighting, you know, Errol Flynn and, and all that, and then later the Ivanhoe movies and such, those weapons are considerably lighter. You can swing them a lot more times Without I have, excuse me, without having to think your arm's about to fall off. That's not the case with the axe. Now, skill, I'm not, skill aside, uh, what else do we have? Well, why do swords hold such a place in our, uh, you know, the, the fable, the sword of Charlemagne, Excalibur, okay, a myth, but still the same thing. Swords hold up special place in our imagination because let's face it anybody looks at it and go oh yeah i could wield that you look at a battle axe and go no maybe i could cut some trees down with it it's more romantic it's more dashing sword fights and you know um i love the musketeer movies with oliver reed and and uh York and those. I, I love those movies for the sword fighting, to the dueling and everything. Um, some of the great writers that we call upon for our basis in, in our mythology uh, were intrigued with, you know, dueling and sword fighting. And so they hold a big place in our collective consciousness. Uh, the musketeers uh, were, you know, that's what that was their thing. They were duelists. Um, great movie with Harvey Keitel and uh, mm, Keith Carradine, the duelists. And that's all they were doing. They were saber fighting all the time. Uh, much more romantic. The 
scar from the dueling schools in Heidelberg and all that crap. At least that's what I think. Your mileage may vary. Okay, now I got to explain something. When I get comments, they're automatically forwarded to my email account almost all the time. And no, I don't go look every week to make sure I got all the comments. So if somebody thinks they're being censored, wrong. If the question or the comment doesn't interest me, I ignore it. I get a lot of very complimentary, hey, great show, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'm not going to read those. I just appreciate them, and I delete them. So, all right. This is, He thinks this was a... Uh, D&D is entertaining to me to detonate frustrations over ridiculous, ridiculous frictional crap and tease my fellow people who take it too seriously, like I am prone to do too. It's comic relief to sometimes read scenarios and monster descriptions besides playing. The number one principle, if you're not having fun, you're better off not playing. Well, I can't argue with that general description. No, if you, why would you do it if you weren't enjoying it? Why do anybody... Uh, um, Primates, like most higher animals, do things that give them serotonin and, and, and things that make them feel good. Whether it's Afri whether it's African elephants walking 180 miles to find uh, the stand of plum trees where the uh, fermented plums are now falling out of the trees so they can just eat them until they get so hammered that they got to lean up against the trees to keep from falling over, which for an elephant is a real bad, real bad scene. Um, we do what makes us feel good and gives us pleasure, plain and simple. All right. Now, this is one of the questions that I wondered, did you really mean it? Or, okay, let's think about it. <laughs> And this goes to crossbreeding, which is a big problem I have with a lot of the D&D, &D, half this, half that bullshit. I understand people like to play it. Okay. But usually they like to play it because they're trying to power a game because it gives them something special. This is not the case. If gnomes and halflings ever had interspecies crossbreeding, what do you think the offspring would be? <laughs> I don't know. Leprechauns? <laughs> Hell, I don't know. You have the possibility right here to create an entire new race for your campaigns that will absolutely flummox all your players because it doesn't exist in any book that they could have read up in advance. No metagaming. No metagaming. And, of course, as we all know, metagaming is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the cardinal sins in role-playing is bringing knowledge that your character doesn't have to the table. There's been discussions of it recently on Facebook on a couple of threads, and I agree with the posters that say metagaming has, you know, no way. no. And I have had occasions at cons, wherever, where somebody goes, well, I'm going to go, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're going to what? How does your character know how to do that? Uh, no. Okay. Let's go back to reality. I hate air quotes, but they're so effective. Um, I don't know. Leprechauns. <laughs> and, and, hey, I'm Irish, and I know leprechauns are part of the Celtic mythology. I'm aware of that. So, but we don't have any origin stories on leprechauns, do we? All right. Okay, there's a good one. Imagine going through a dimensional warp to where swords do great damage and have charges and wands and spells have less effect. That sounds like an interesting world. Um, I have several friends who have over the years told me that in their their individual campaigns, 
Magic is very, very scarce. Very scarce. Spells, items, whatever. So, great swords, because, you know, be a great sword, it's got to be enchanted, or, you know, it's got to be belong to a demigod or something. Um, great swords would, would have even more of an effect, and if you had a sword that cast lightning or you know, through fire, flamed on, you know, flame on or any of those, uh, that would be, uh, that would make you a really bad individual. However, you don't say anything about missile weapons. And I don't care how good your sword is, if I got a good archer or two focusing in on you, your great sword won't stop those two arrows from skewering you like a pineapple ready to go onto the Barbie. But no, that would be an interesting world. And I encourage people to make up world settings like that. Create a backstory of how things work. And then start a new campaign, read it to your players, and go. I like that idea. Less magic. Gary would probably like that too. Less magic. More fighting. Okay. Here's the one I keep getting in various forms. And I'll give you the best answer I can. What was the reasoning behind weapons doing different damage against differently sized monsters? It's a bit non-intuitive that generally all I need to look again. All right. He's got to look at his player handbook. It's always higher damage against larger matter monsters than rather than the contrary. I'm guessing it has something to do with the way hit points are abstracted, and perhaps Gary determined there was an imbalance with the way large monsters had so many more hit dice. We'd love to hear the official thinking behind the mechanics. Okay. I can only give you the hearsay, because I wasn't there when those decisions were made. But it's my understanding that in their correspondence, Dave and Gary addressed this. And... Um, I once talked to Gary about something like this, and, I, and he used one of his beloved pole arms <laughs> as an example about poking a man with a pole arm as opposed to poking a big, we'll say a, a, an elephant. While the man is the man's body, when it gets hit, a lot of the energy and force is going to be lost to the movement of the body. As you skew him, he's going to go back, and the weapon will only go through so far. Now, I might come out of his back, but you know, there it's out of his back. Now, stab that same pole arm into an elephant with a full, and it's going to go in deeper. Because the elephant's going to stand there and absorb the blow as it slices into its innards. There's a logic to it. And yes, it has to do with hit points and their original abstracted notion. As long as you had hit points, you weren't dead. When you ran out of them, whoops, that one killed you. Monsters, elephants, we don't even have to have malicious, malignant monsters. Elephants are so much greater in mass, they have lots more hit points. Because you can poke them, <laughs> if you're so inclined, with spears with heads this long, a bunch of times before you're likely to <coughs> wound them severely enough or weaken them severely enough that you can get in and get that spear right in the eyeball into the brain type, killing blow. That's kind of a gory and <laughs> bloody example, but it kind of explains the theory behind weapons doing greater damage against large or very large and that's part of the mass meets, the, the, the momentum meets mass thing as a logic. Just think about that. 
how many times could you poke a spear into a 200 point elephant and your spear does yeah we'll give it a give you a good spear three to 12 or okay let's go four to 16. so you're going to have an average of uh four um two four six eight um you're going to average uh nine no, ten points yeah two and a half times four ten points how many ten points to get that 200 pound elephant down Whereas if you're only poking it for five points, it's twice as many pokes. And by that time, that elephant's liable to have grabbed you by his trunk and skewered you on one of his tusks or smashed your head like a grapefruit under his foot. So it's a trained elephant, we'll say. But even a wild, maddened elephant. So sometimes it, it, it's sometimes easier to understand some of the things if you apply a real-life scenario to it. Okay, skewering a man with eight arrows, depending upon their impact and their and their penetration, and skewering even a big bull, a big cow with those eight arrows, unless you're standing right up next to it and shooting him behind the ribs and the lungs, is just going to really piss off that bull. But poke him with that spare that does an average of 10 points every poke. And you got a lot better chance of killing him before he kills you. If that's what you want to do, if you're a meat eater or whatever. I'm not advocating going out and stab the neighbor's cow to prove this theory. I hope you don't, <laughs> I hope you don't require that. Excuse me. Still looking for that energy drink sponsor. If any of you have connections, get a hold of me. See if I can line something up. If it isn't awful, <laughs> I'll drink it. Um, okay, next. Okay, this is a good one. I had a question about the degree of hand-waving between adventures during a campaign for restocking and supply. Do your towns have medieval war marks where your players purchase swords and armor next to the rope and toiletries? Okay, um, I'm wondering what degree the old games Gary would have turned the downtime into a mini adventures to obtain a better sword if there's just simply a cost in terms of passive the gen game time. So if the nearest city which had a blacksmith would have just added X amount of weeks to the passage of time. Uh, I know you mentioned this several times for wizard research. It was more of a question requisite gold and fan. Okay, um, the gist of that. I know I mumbled my way through it. Pardon me. This new posture, new camera thing, I'm still getting used to. Oh, yeah. In my year and a half campaign that I ran as a playtest session at Carbondale, the only long campaign I have ever run, we didn't have a lot of large towns and cities. So I kind of in, in the course of the campaign, there were so many little mini adventures to go find this clue, which would then could take us to that clue, which then would take us to the map to find the thing we've been looking for because we were looking for um, we were looking for the laboratory of somebody who'd been dead a long, long time, and um, but still had an acolyte that uh, was a big threat. So. Um, there was some, a couple of small villages, and when they had to rest up, they would go to the village and um, determine how long it would take. Because back then, we paid some attention to healing up. Uh, we didn't do training. And I would simply bleed their cash. And occasionally, if I knew somebody was let, you know, occasionally I'd have a traveling uh, weapons peddler wagon come through. And they'd have one good thing uh, worth buying. And I, I'd watch the guys scuffle and borrow money from each other. And it. And so, you know, they got better stuff as it went along. I did it different ways. I didn't have a swords emporium. I didn't have, uh, I had wandering hedge wizards that some of which knew real, really neat things, uh, far greater, more intense, intensely complex spells than you might expect a hedge wizard to have. So they could learn from them. Um, 
it wasn't just hand waving, but we didn't get into the grit and the detail of the day-to-day -day existence of what happened. They got taxed for it. Um, sometimes they wanted things they couldn't find. And uh, yeah, there were weapons and magic to be found along the way. And that's way we played from the ground up. And when I left, everybody was somewhere around ninth to 12th level, except the Hobbit. He was, <laughs> he wasn't human. Um, he was the party thief. <laughs> he must have been 14th or 15th. Um, as to what Gary did on downtime, I think Gary kept a very complex book of who was healing up and who wasn't and expected the players to, which is why we had the stable of characters. Oh, Fred won. You know, <laughs> I'm anticipating an upcoming question. Fred won is, is uh, over in... Um, this area over where Rob's running a thing and Fred too is still uh holed up in an overnight down in the bottom of Greyhawk. And, you know, and so, ah, Fred four is available. And so that character uh, would go to play in that adventure. Um, I didn't, I didn't, we didn't really, the only reason we kept track of time was either wizards researching, which I would keep track of on a rough timeline that I kept, so that you know, if you're still researching, no, you can't. That character can't go on this one. And the other reason uh, we measured time was so I could figure out how to drain their money. You know, holding up for four days isn't going to cost what holding up for ten days is. And where they're able to hold up. Sometimes I'd only give them expensive places. So they'd watch their funds do it. Like, okay, what's the next hook? And off they'd go. Um, nowadays, I don't run anything that need, I need to keep track of it. And I tell people when I am running uh, adventures now um, that, no, I don't count sling stones. I don't count arrows. Um that's not what we're here for. We're here to have a good time and solve these problems and 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 get some laughs. So I, I, I wave my hands at that. I don't always wave my hands at encumbrance. Um, I've had people try to do, want to do silly stuff and uh, ask them who, who they're going to get to help them pick it up and things like that. So my experience doesn't, relate all that well to some of you who have been campaigning for 20 years. I write the adventures, but I don't run the campaigns. Um, I don't, I had a short, a short campaign going here in Cincinnati a few years back where I was using the guys, same, same batch of characters. And I was running them through adventures that I was busy writing. And, um, so they were playtesting for me, but we used it as a campaign stuff. They found in one they could keep and play in the other. And uh, there wasn't a need to keep track of a lot of time. Okay. Now, here's some, and there, here's a line here. It's the only line in the message. And it absolutely sums up the very early days of D&D, &D, as well as a funnel game in Dungeon Crawl Classics. Character. Fred one dies. Fred two dies. In many ellipses, Fred 13. <laughs> and that's fine. Um, Gary used to do it. I, I, I used to do it when I ran more complex adventures at, event, at, at games. Uh, oh, <laughs> what luck. Your brother caught up to you. Wow. <laughs> caught up to the party. It's your twin brother. Come on. Let's go. So, um, yeah, that's cool. Uh, okay, and I'm, I'm the last question that I'm going to close on. When you played OD&D &D back in the 70s, did you combine your adventures with tabletop wargaming? Or was this not a part of D&D? It was, for some people, in a tiny way. I'll explain. Gary first advocated using as a map for doing plotting outdoors. 
an Avalon Hill board game, box game, called Outdoor Adventures. So if we were traveling overland, yes, some of us would use that map. And sometimes you would only travel, you know, three hexes on the map. But, you know, this, you scaled it up much greater for the game. But to my knowledge, um, there was one other game that I I played in and played with and I know of a few other people that did it was called the war of wizards and uh, it was an int it was a really interesting game where two wizards had an arcane duel and um, we used it as an accepted form of ritual con combat okay now step aside obviously the two players had to be familiar with the rules and you know and they were they were they were or they didn't do it so yeah to that extent we used a um very simple game called war of the wizards um i don't remember offhand who put that out and uh outdoors adventures and there was a little bit of interest but it's really not a tabletop game. It, when um, On Guard came out from uh, Game Designers Workshop, the uh, dueling and sword fighting rules. But that's really another RPG that some of us looked at just to see if that would be fun, again, as a form of a ritual duel. And uh, that's about all I can think of. The, the, yeah, it, it, for the most part, it was not part of the game. Uh, we were still finding our way to what exactly was the game. Um, that's it for now. Um, got some cons coming up about three weeks. Well, two and a half weeks now I'll be out in uh, Massachusetts for uh, total con. And then less than a month later, I'll be in Lake Geneva for Gary con running games at both uh, sites. Uh, nothing but Wheel of Lane D and D games in TotalCon, and those kind of games plus one uh, Dirt Track Saturday Night uh, uh, late model modifieds in the Dirt Slugfest last year was oh my God we only had three running at the end, uh, <laughs> and at that point the other two weren't going to catch the leader and we called the race, <laughs> and they were all happy with it. Um, and uh let's see what else well i'm gonna i'm my wife and i are planning a trip down to new orleans we hope in april i want to go back to the world war ii museum now that it's fully open we were there several years ago but it was only partially open and i want to spend at least a day so i don't know where she's going to go that day <laughs> but i know i'm going to the museum and um that's it until texas so on that night um, on <laughs> this night, on that note, I'll say, do da da go v. Oh, hello. I'm still figuring out when this thing starts. <clears throat> Welcome to my cellar. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D and D and old school RPGs. Still quite a feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Last man around when the race went down. Calling Gary in that Lake Geneva town. Hey Gary, it's an awful mess. Let me edit, we'll have success. D and D and Dragon Magazine. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D and D and old school RPGs, but still quite the feller, curmudgeon in the cellar. Magic missile with a mortar shell, make it hit in the first level spell. From psionics to the game, you attack that wizard's brain. DSR and Fantasy, collection of micro armories. 
tight and lift tramp under a tree. Pie as could be. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D&D and old school RPGs, but he's still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Come on.